Welcome to Buckaroo TV, your resource for B2B marketing for manufacturing and related industries. You create unrivaled products and services. We tell your story. Now on to the show. Good morning. My name is Deb Daly, co-founder of Buckaroo Marketing New Media and your host for today's program. Joining me today is Donald Jason. He is the owner, executive vice president at Bendheim. Welcome to our show, Donald. Thanks a lot, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Oh, not a problem. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, my background, uh, I was uh, born in New Jersey, uh, one of three brothers. Um, I went to school uh, and uh, have a degree in economics, which uh, doesn't really help me a whole lot in business. And um, uh, was intending to go on and uh, get an MBA uh, when uh, many years ago, my dad wasn't well and my brother asked to help in the family business and I decided to help and I've stayed here since full time since 1980. Okay. So that's a long time. Okay. That's great. Cause I was curious about how you got involved with the company. If, if, you know, when you were a little kid, you always knew that you'd be, you know, in this we, we always worked in the company as kids uh, doing samples and uh, uh, as you know, our, our, our parents, uh, uh, my father abused the child labor laws. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now tell me about your dad because he just had a special event. Right. So our, our dad uh, is an interesting person. He was born in 1921 in Germany. Um, he was a child prodigy, prodigy of, of Wunderkind. And he uh, played the violin, concertized uh, when he was 12 years old. Um, and um, luckily, uh, he was on one of the last transports out of Germany in 1938. He arrived in the U.S. Uh, together with, uh, and met his family here. And um, he then um, fought in World War II, came back, went on a music scholarship, and was with the Houston Symphony. Um, and uh, he met our mom on a blind date. And uh, three months later, they were married. My mom's parents started the company in the 1920s. Okay. And uh, our dad said, okay, the heck with the violin. I'll go into the glass business. So uh, (laughs) he went to the glass business and uh, my mom was an only child and had three of us, three boys, um, being the middle one. And uh, we all wound up in the glass business. And my dad still comes to work every day, uh, May 14th. He turned a hundred years old. He drives by himself. And uh, I still get lectured every once in a while for being immature. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, and, and I posted that uh, event on LinkedIn. And uh, I think as of this morning, uh, close to 1.6 million views from all around the world. And in fact, I think uh, that's what garnered your attention. Yes, it, it was. I thought that was, uh, you know, very uh, unique. Plus, you don't see a lot of companies that are privately held, multi-generational, that survive 100 years. Um, mm-hmm. So many times they get, you know, something happens during the process, so they're no longer in, uh, in existence. And that was one of the things that fascinated me, too, uh, was, you know, your longevity and your staying power. Mm-hmm. Um, now, tell me a little bit about, you have like three different divisions. So the, the company was founded in the 1920s by our maternal grandparents. And uh, they came over from Germany before World War I, Margaret and Sem. And uh, our grandmother's mother had a boarding house in New York for Germans. And my grandfather came over when he was 17 years old, alone from Germany. His father was in the glass business. And our grandparents met in this boarding house, fell in love, got married. And my grandfather lived and ate and breathed stained glass. So he decided to start uh, an import distribution company called S.A. Benheim. Solomon mm-hmm. Arthur Benheim was his name. So uh, he originally started act- actually out in the um, cedar business. He was a buyer of cedar for the pencil industry. Okay. And, uh, and then he uh, added glass and then he left the cedar business and, uh, and focused on glass. So he started an import distribution company and we imported mouth blown handmade glass from Germany uh, and a lot of people don't understand how a flat sheet of glass is mouth blown. But in any case, we have over 500 standard colors of this mouth blown glass, sheets of glass uh, that we in turn sell on a wholesale basis to stained glass studios who in turn fabricate stained glass windows. 
So the windows in St. Patrick's and uh, the windows at West Point and these types of things. And um, so it was essentially a stained glass business. Um, and uh, our father joined the company uh, in 1951. It was located in Manhattan, in New York City. And um, uh, it was originally on Horatio Street in Greenwich Village. And in 1958, uh, our grandfather moved the business to 122 Hudson Street, which is in lower Manhattan. And now it's uh, Tribeca, which stands for Triangle Below Canal, uh, where many movie stars live. So it's a six story building there. And we occupied the entire building as a glass warehouse. So we had glass on seven levels when one freight elevator so it was not an extremely practical place to run a glass business. Um, and we had to back in 40 foot trailers into these small side streets and un unload them by hand because the loading dock was built for horse and buggy. Wow. So um, that's where the three of us, the three boys worked and, and it's where I started in the glass business. Uh, and in, in the 19, uh, I, I started as a kid, obviously full-time in 1980. My brother, Robert, my older brother started in 1976 and my younger brother in 1985. So we were essentially uh, selling, uh, stained glass boomed in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And um, as a Tiffany craze uh, spread across the country, many other types of glass became popular. Uh, opalescent cathedral glass. These are machine roll glasses. Opalescent glass is glass with white mixed in. And it's a glass that you see in, in Tiffany lamps and Tiffany type lamps. And there's a mm -hmm. Tiffany craze. And stained glass grew as a big hobby throughout the country and thousands of retail stores taught this hobby to hobbyists and stained glass just naturally grew. So we had many other types of glass other than in addition to the mouth blown handmade glass, more than a thousand different types of glass. And my brother, Robert, in the 1980s had a fantastic idea. We had a glass in stock, a handmade mouth blown glass called Goethe glass. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody could pronounce the name Goethe. And uh, he looked at it. It was a clear glass that had slight wobble to it and distortion. And Robert asked him, he said, Robert thought it looks exactly like glass found in historical buildings. So if you go into an historical building and you look at the window glass, you see it's a little bit wobbly and it distorted. And that's because uh, of the process in which the glass was made. Uh, and all glass primarily today is perfect. It's made uh, with what we call the float glass method, uh, which was invented in the 1950s by the Pilkington brothers. So float glass is absolutely perfect. So then the question becomes, what do you do when you break a piece of glass in a historically sensitive building? If you put in today's window glass, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. So Robert said, there's gotta be a market for this. So uh, we wanted to market this, this uh, glass as a building product. We didn't wanna market it as a stained glass product because stained glass has a very strong connotation. One thinks right. Tiffany, ecclesiastical, Correct. Hobby. It's just got a very strong uh, meaning for, for it's people. Got a, it's got a rich history of its own. Right. So what we did is uh, we wanted to sell it as a building product. And we knocked on some big doors. We went to the biggest window companies in the United States, Anderson, Marvin, Pella. And we gave our pitch and tried to sell restoration glass. By the way, we created the glass in two levels of distorted, distortion. Uh, less distorting for structures built in the um, turn of the century, 1800s, the turn of the last century, 1800s to the turn of the 1900s, and then full restoration glass, more distorting for earlier structures. Mm -hmm. So we made the pitch, and uh, the glass was at the time probably eight to ten dollars per square foot, and big window companies were probably paying 15 cents per square foot for glass. Right. So get out of here, nobody wants that stuff. It's just too expensive. The sheets are not uniform because it's made by hand and so we said, okay, so we went to glass distributors. Same reaction, get out of here, nobody wants that, that glass, it's too expensive. So we knew it was a great product, but we needed to figure out an entirely new way to market it. So what we did uh, after a lot of, uh, of meetings and um, you know, uh, knocking around ideas, we decided to focus on architects specializing in historical restoration. So we identified that subset of architects focused on that subset, advertised in specific trade publications for restoration glass, sent samples, went to trade shows just to promote restoration glass. And over time, architects started to specify the glass. Mm -hmm. So it went from the architect and from the architect to the general contractor and from the general contractor to the installer. And then the installers, of course, uh, needed to purchase the glass from us. 
So over years, it took off. It's been um, used in Monticello, in Mount Vernon, uh, all the windows at the White House or that were broken. The White House uh, purchased enough to redo the White House two times over and they hold it in stock. The glass, is, by the way, is so close, it's indistinguishable from the original glass. And each piece the White House replaces needs to be archived so they can, dis you know, they can distinguish it from original glass. Wow. So it's indistinguishable. Um, it's been featured on this old house and Martha Stewart's show. She was gracious enough to, to include it on her show. And it really took off. And then when we had this dialogue with architects, they started asking, do you have any other, other types of glass? And of course we had thousands of types of glass because of our, of our uh, stock for the, ultimately for the stained glass industry. Right. But nobody, the challenge was that nobody knew how to offer these glasses in safety form. And there's two types of safety glass and they're both in your car, um, uh, tempered and laminated. So your car side window is tempered glass and tempered glass is made by taking what we call anneal glass. It's anneal glass is a form in which processors buy glass. Uh, annealing is a controlled cooling process of glass from its molten state to room temperature. So um, when we buy glass, big sheets of it, we buy it in annealed form. So anneal glass can be cut, polished, drilled, but if it breaks, you're gonna get sliced. It's very dangerous. Right. So, um, so if you break a window in your house, a regular window, that's anneal glass. If you break it, you can get cut. So tempered glass is we take anneal glass and it goes into a furnace, which we call a tempering furnace. And it goes on to oscillating ceramic rollers and the glass gets heated to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit or 600 Celsius. And when it reaches that temperature, it gets transferred into another section of the oven, which is called the quench. And in the quench, it gets cooled very rapidly with air. And uh, during that process, it forms a compression strength in the glass. And the glass is four times as strong as it was before it was tempered. And if it breaks, it dices, it crumbles, like your car side window. I don't know if you've ever seen that break, but yeah. it crumbles. So the but it still tempered stays glass, in one piece. Well, yeah, well, tempered glass doesn't stay in one piece. Tempered okay, glass, it just, if it breaks, it, it just crumbles. So um, um, the only thing you can do to temper glass, essentially, after it's tempered, is break it, right? So if somebody asks, oh, can I cut that down? No. It's the size is a size. Or can I put a hole in it? No. It, it, once it's tempered, it's literally cooked. The other type of safety glass is laminated glass. That's in your car windshield. Laminated glass is two pieces of glass, typically annealed, stuck together, or adhered together with a, a, an adhesive, which we call PVB, polyvinyl butyrol. There's different types of interlayer, which I won't bore you with, but the main one is PVB. And if, if your windshield breaks, um, it'll crack, but it stays in one piece. So a, a real good visual is sometimes they say, do you want to know the difference between tempered and laminated glass? And you take a baseball bat and you go out to your car and you hit the windshield and it'll crack, but it stays in one piece. And take that same bat and hit your side window hard enough, it'll blow out and it'll dice. So those are the two types of safety glass. So architects asked us, do you have any other types of glass? And we had thousands of types of glass, but nobody knew how to offer these glasses in safety form. Mm -hmm. And many had preconceptions and thought uh, it was not possible to offer decorative glasses in safety form. And we uh, were probably too dumb to know that that wasn't possible. So, Sometimes uh, ignorance is bliss and you, you know, it's good that you don't know because then you just are fearless and you right. move forward. Well, you know, we, we have a, a, a passion for innovation. And um, so what we did at the time is we uh, contacted a tempering company because we, we weren't fabricators at the time. So we co contacted a tempering company that was slow at the time, a laminator that was slow at the time. And we said, are you interested in fabricating our glass for the market? And they said, sure. But there was a big learning curve involved with this. And... Uh, there, there were, you know, not everything we tried was successful, uh, but we ultimately over a period of time figured out which ones could be tempered, which ones couldn't, which ones could be laminated, how to laminate. There's more than one way to laminate glass. And uh, we started offering architects thousands of types of decorative glasses for use in architecture. And it really started taking off. Uh, it took off in such a way that the model of outsourcing was no longer viable. 
Um, so we had to make a decision. Uh, in 1989, by the way, we moved out of Manhattan to a one level facility in New Jersey, uh, which we were leasing at the time. And um, uh, we converted the building in New York City to commercial real estate. And that, of course, that turned into Tribeca. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a good move. And, um, and then we decided we needed to vertically integrate and do our own manufacturing. We did some analysis, quick analysis. It was pretty clear that we looked at how much we were spending on outsourcing and we looked at the cost of equipment, said, we can do this. So we, um, we took a, on additional space and we uh, bought our first uh, tempering furnace in uh, right around uh, more than 20 years ago. Okay. And since that time, we have added more process. So we vertically integrated the production process. And it grew to such a point that um, four years ago, we moved the company and purchased the old Toshiba headquarters here in New Jersey. So we're now in 140,000 square foot facility on 12 acres. And um, uh, also what happened is with this dialogue uh, with architects, um, the we're always listening to see what they're looking for. and. We've increased our product offering. And um, the other big differentiator of Benheim are the connections that we have that go back to Europe, which were established by our grandparents mm -hmm. on a handshake. So uh, the family in Europe, Lamberts, uh, uh, there were three brothers. The youngest brother owned and operated the factory where they made the mouth blown handmade glass. And the two older brothers um, owned and operated a factory, the large, largest privately owned uh, glass factory in Europe, one of the largest owned, privately owned factories where they make machine roll pattern glass and channel glass, glass in the shape of a U channel. Right. Um, and so, and channel glass was not even available in the United States. So now that we have this contact with architects, we decided we're gonna create a new company, which we're gonna call Benheim Wall Systems. And we started that in 2001. And Benheim Wall Systems, we created to sell channel glass. And channel glass is glass, again, in the shape of a U-channel. Glass is only about a quarter of an inch, five sixteenths of an inch thick. But the form in which it's formed is extremely strong. So these planks of glass are 10 inches to 19 inches wide and up to 23 feet long. Wow. And they're interlocking, interlocking. So one panel fits inside the other. So one can build entire walls out of these glass planks for exteriors of buildings primarily, but it can also be used for interior walls. And it's easy to curve them and span large areas without, uh, if you think about it, without any intermediate support, because right. since they're interlocking, you don't need frames. Right. So um, uh, my brother, Robert, uh, heads up the exterior division. And um, the first few years were obviously challenging because uh, the adoption of a brand new product uh, in the U.S. Um, takes time, yeah, and yeah. the gestation period of those projects is longer than an interior project. So um, typically when we're working on an interior for a tenant fit out or a tenant improvement, the, uh, the, the time from when you meet the architect to the time when the glass actually gets used uh, can be a year to a year and a half. On some of these exterior projects, it can be several years. Right, so. Right. Um, uh, Fortunately, the, the, uh, we were able to um, uh, work on the largest channel glass project in the United States. It's called the Nelson Atkins Museum. It's in Kansas City. It's five buildings, um, partially below grade and uh, over 100,000 square feet of channel glass was used uh, to create the, um, the walls of these, these buildings. Um, and uh, it lets a light in underground to the galleries below. And uh, the, uh, the project has um, made international news. And that really gave Benheim Wall Systems a, a kickstart. And um, uh, about four years ago, well, so Channel Glass was um, basically the one product that Benheim Wall Systems offered. And about four years ago, our good friend in Austria, Oswin Lengla, who's fourth or fifth generation glass business, uh, he had invented a compression fitting. And these compression fittings go on to post, the post go on to a building and the glass simply gets clipped into these compression fittings. So there's no need to drill the glass. They're very adjustable. And it's a really fast way to change the look of an existing building, or it's also used a lot in new construction. So 
we decided to add uh, glass rain screens as a product line to Benheim Wall Systems offering. So uh, a lot of people know what rain screens are and they think of terracotta or metal panels. Uh, many don't think about glass and glass is a perfect product for rain screens. So it's, it's rain screens and ventilated facades. One of the first projects we did in the US was in San Jose. It was a nondescript building built in the 1980s, probably uh, very plain looking dated and uh, the architect wanted to create an entirely new look for this building. So essentially what they did is they painted the structure of the building and then they clad the building with glass, different levels of white laminated glass. White laminated glass, we can supply in different levels of opacity. So it can be either dense white or translucent white. And these panels were held in place with our system uh, and it totally transformed the look of the building at the same time it protected the facade against the elements, wind and rain. So uh, it, it, it protects the building and transforms the look of existing buildings. And it also can be used in new construction. So uh, in New York City, we recently uh, clad the top of a skyscraper with our rain screen system, and it held the glass in place in the tower uh, with uh, a uh, pattern glass that we have. By the way, uh, we have over a hundred different pattern glasses. And pattern glass is made by molten glass rolling to, through two steel rollers. And one of the steel rollers has a pattern and it impresses a glass okay. with a pattern. So we use pattern glass, laminated pattern glass, which diffuses the light with a white interlayer at the top of the skyscraper held in place with our rain screen system, which is illuminated. Rain screen systems um, also uh, can incorporate other products. So we did a football stadium recently in, in Iowa for the Hawkeyes and incorporated uh, fiber cement panels in the same system. And uh, it's all engineered uh, very carefully so that it can be assembled very quickly on site. Mm -hmm. So the, the football season had to start, uh, the parts and pieces were sent to the job site, pre-assembled, and then uh, it was installed very, very quickly. So um, um, it, it's interesting uh, because um, uh, at Architects, um, Big architects offices have interior architects and they have those architects who work on core and shell exterior applications and they speak different languages. Mm -hmm. Literally, well, not literally, but some of the words obviously they use are, um, are different and their concerns are different. Um, right. So uh, interior architects are, are sometimes mostly concerned with aesthetics. Is it the right color? Is it the right look? Is it is it gonna fit in with the design aesthetic? Uh, and and um, architects focusing on exteriors are uh, more performance oriented. Uh, what's the U value and, and um, uh, what's the shading coefficient? How does it perform? Uh, is it gonna, going to withstand, is the system going to sustain, sustain seismic racking? And, 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 and what, what's the wind load? So th those, are, those are not typical questions asked by uh, an interior architect. So um, it's, 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 it's been an interesting journey. Sure. Well, you've got different applications mm -hmm. and, you know, sure, of course, there's going to be different needs and, and what, you know, there's a multitude of, of, you know, types of glass that you can have put in between the channel and, and the textured and formed and all of that that you've uh, suggested. Sure. Another uh, uh, glass that, that uh, one would, one would uh, not think there's a big demand for is chicken wire glass. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, glass in, in an old building with chicken wire. I have. That was, uh, uh, chicken wire was embedded into the molten glass. It's no longer made. Uh, but what we do is we take actual chicken wire and we're laminating it between two pieces of glass. And it could be either clear glass or it could be a pattern glass. So we did a massive project um, a few years ago for Floyd Bennett Field where Amelia Earhart took off, I guess in the 1930s, and uh, over 4,000 uh, panes of... Uh, chicken wire laminated glass with a texture uh, we supplied for the restoration of Floyd Bennett airfield hangar. So that's also uh, shown on our website. It was a really interesting project. That is great. I know that um, uh, I'm into a lot of architectural uh, salvage shows and whatnot. And that's a big thing as far as finding the, the glass with uh, the chicken wire in it and everything. And uh, it, it gives it such a cool look. Right, uh, but obviously, it does it. I assume it adds a level of durability or sturdiness. 
Well, a laminated glass, well, actual chicken wire glass, the original chicken wire glass is not safety glass. Okay. And uh, if, if that breaks and you put you try to put your hand through it, you're going to get severely cut. So it's, it's uh, sometimes it's the best, you know, it's the best option if you're doing a restoration. If you can find salvage glass and you need a few pieces, fine. If you're doing a big project, the glass that we actually provided for this Floyd Bennett uh, airfield uh, is a safety laminate. So it's actually a safety glass. Uh, if one were to hit it, it's going to break, but it stays intact, like your car windshield. Right. It also has the added benefit of having UV protection because the PVB interlayer uh, provides a, a, a degree of UV protection, blocks uh, about 99% of the UV light up to a certain wavelength, 380 nanometers. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so you've got, you've got your uh, partners overseas, so you don't actually blow the glass here. Correct. So we don't we don't make the raw glass. Um, so the, the mouth blown glass is made in a factory in Germany, in Bavaria, uh, uh, right by the Czech border in a town called Waldsassen. It's about two and a half hours outside of Munich. Really interesting field trip for any of your listeners. If you're ever so inclined to go to Germany, to Munich, get in touch with me. Gladly uh, arrange a tour of the factory, which is fascinating, and it's not on the tourist path as one can imagine. Right. So uh, uh, it, to see them uh, transform molten glass into a flat sheet, briefly, what they do is they take a molten glass at the end of a, a blowpipe, they make a small bubble, and spin it, and then they take a bigger gather of glass on that bubble and hand it to the glass master who uh, swings it out, blows it out, and makes a big bubble. They pop the bubble, and then they spin it, making a half a cylinder, detach a blowpipe, reheat the other end, spin it, making a full cylinder. And after the cylinder's made, it's slowly cooled or annealed. And after it's annealed, they put a crack in it with a glass cutter. They take the crack cylinders, and then they uh, put them into another furnace where they heat it up and open it up gradually and flat it into a sheet. So every sheet is made that way, and it's called the cylinder method. For making glass, it's called we call it antique glass, not because it's old, but because the process is the same as it was hundreds of years ago. Um, and so that's mouth blown glass. Um, machine roll glass, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, is made in typically big production, uh, and and it can either be made in a small production or big production. Here in the states, uh, there are certain manufacturers who still make it in an old fashioned way, one sheet at a time with a ladle, they take a ladle of molten glass, plop it on a table and put it through two rollers and they make one sheet at a time. Um, and, but most of the machine roll glass, uh, which is made in a large facility, there's a molten tank of glass and, uh, and the glass is passed through two steel rollers. One of the rollers has a pattern, impresses the glass and it comes off in a continuous ribbon. And the ribbon is then slowly cooled or annealed in a very long line and at the end of the line, that ribbon is cut and packed into cases. Mm -hmm. uh, a a, um, a, a um, rolled production, normally in one day, quarter inch glass, they make about 50,000 square feet in one day. So, uh, which is a lot of glass, but uh, with float glass, as I mentioned earlier, window glass, glass you see in your cars, glass you see in all office buildings, that's made with what we call a float method. The float method was invented in, the 1950s by the Pilkington brothers, and that's the name of a company, Pilkington, is still one of the primary manufacturers of float glass. There's about five manufacturers worldwide. A float plant costs about $150 million to build. Uh, a float plant, uh, float glasses, the molten, the, the materials are melted at the beginning of the line, sand, potash, silica, and uh, it's an overflow tank. And so they melt so much of this raw glass that it overflows and they flow it over a liquid bed of tin. Mm. And since it goes on this liquid bed of tin, the tin is more dense than the glass. The glass floats over that liquid bed of tin continuously, comes off in a continuous ribbon where it's slowly cooled and then cut at the end of the line. And a float plant runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And every day a float plant produces about 700 tons of glass. Wow. So that's why in float glass, you don't see too many um, varieties in color. There's clear, 
There's what we call low iron clear or optically clear glass. It doesn't have the greenish hue. There's bronze, gray, blue, and maybe light green. That's it. Um, and that's why with the mouth blown glass, it's made in much smaller batches. So the factory has a standard palette of 5,000 colors. And the colors in glass are created by the melting of different metal oxides. So um, cobalt makes blue, chromium green, seleniums, reds, and oranges, gold, pink. So we have glass, we have a glass here called gold pink. And of course, that's the most expensive one because you, it's a bubblegum pink color and one needs to use gold oxide in the raw melt to create that color. Hmm. Normal flow glass, if you go to the hardware store and you, and you want a pane of glass and you look at it from the edge, you'll see it's very green. Uh, and, and it's green because of the iron oxide content of the raw melt. And um, when we back paint glass, we do a lot of back painted glass and somebody wants a really ultra white glass. If we were to use regular float glass and we were to back paint it with an ultra white paint, it's going to look uh, light green. It's going to look uh, so. So that's not, not so. Every major manufacturer of float glass has a low iron version or uh, with a, less of that iron oxide in the raw melt, and uh, that's a more expensive glass. But that's the glass that we use to back paint typically because we get the most accurate color read. Sure, uh, sure. A, a green glass always shifts the color. Sure. Of course, if we're, if we're doing black back painted glass, there's no need to use a more expensive low iron glass where we'd use a regular, a regular you know, green float glass for that. Um, one of the things that you talked about um, when the um, master glass maker, how deep is, and I, just for our listeners, I will include a, a, a hyperlink to the video so that you can see this because it really is a fascinating Super. process. But how deep is that pit? Because when he's got the glass on blowing and it's and it's this big cylindrical, almost looks like a water balloon, but giant, and mm -hmm. he's swinging it back and forth like this massive pendulum. How deep is that pit? So there, so that pit pit is twelve feet deep. Um, most of the glass that that the factory makes uh, in German is what they call echt antique, which in German means real antique, um, and and that's not. They don't use a pit in that at all. It's all free blown. So there's no pit that's used. And the max size of those sheets is approximately 24 by 36. So two foot by three foot sheets. Um, the, um, there's a new, there's a, another glass they call Neu Antique, uh, which is also mouth blown, but that's the one that they swing into a pit. Uh, and, and those, that cylinder is bigger and the sheets are probably 36 by 40. So they're larger. Um, that, and, and with the restoration glass, that's exactly how we make the, what we call the light restoration glass, the less distorting of the two. Restoration glass never touches a mold at all. It's all free blown, very difficult glass to make. So it's made both in full and light. The full is the echt antique, the light is what they call noy antique. And uh, so, so, but most of the glass at that factory is is not swung in that deep pit. Okay. So from a standpoint of, this is just kind of a historical standpoint, obviously blowing glass is, is you know, an art form. You know, it's not uh -huh. just something you just go to school for and say, hey, I'm going to go get a job and be a glass blower. Um, how long does, I assume it's kind of an apprenticeship program that you start out and Correct. How, how long does it take to become a master glass blower? Well, first off, uh, not everybody can be a master glass blower. Uh, I would be a prime example of someone who could never be a master glass blower um, because well, you have to have a skill set and it's, it's, it's almost a, an athletic ability in a way as well. So uh, there's an apprenticeship over there. I'm not typically uh, what one would start off doing there is carry the cylinders. We have what's called a Walzenscheiger. My brother Robert actually apprenticed in that factory long ago as a Walton trigger, and I visited him uh, when I was in high school when he was carrying cylinders. Um, and there's a lot of beer, so I don't remember too much of that trip. <laughs> so, um, uh, but but in any case, uh, the the um, they they they, uh, they started out as a cylinder carrier, and then um, they have another position position called unfanger or beginner. Uh, where the beginner uh, takes the first gather of glass and makes the small bubble. 
and they might be in that position for the rest of their lives. Uh, or then if they have the skill set, then they, they say, well, this, this person could ultimately be a master glass blower. And, um, and then there, it takes years to become a master glass blower. And they, they don't, they're all really great, but not all of them even have the skill to do that huge bubble in the 12 foot deep pit. There's only a few of the guys there who can do that. Right. And that takes a certain level of uh, physical strength along with uh, a real fine um, dexterity. So it's a, yeah. the, the other uh, really uh, important job there is the one who has all the recipes to create all these different tonalities of glass. And if you think about it, you know, we, right here in, in New Jersey, we have maybe 100 different blues and there's different um, shades of blue. And to right. repeat those, those colors with different recipes and mixes uh, is an art form in and of itself. So um, that's also really um, important. You know, uh, one of the things we've done as the business has grown, um, the stained glass part of the business or the mouth blown part of the business uh, is becoming smaller and smaller in, in terms of our, of our annual turnover. Uh, however, uh, it's still our core, mm -hmm. our origin, uh, and it, I think it's, we we think it's really important that it it's it, it continues. And fortunately, now um, the ownership of that factory is uh, under a fellow by the name of Reiner Mindel, who is passionate about glass. Also owns a large studio over there, and uh, it has great leadership, terrific team. They make an incredible, simply the best mouthball glass in the world emanates from that factory and uh, it, it's healthy. So, um, and we want it to continue that way and, and it's an important part of our business. So uh, we, we, um, we hold it dear. Oh, I, absolutely. And, and that is, it's fascinating. And, and uh, just, I don't, you know, I know that if you get into Boston and the restoration areas, you know, they're very specific about the, the restoration glass. And, and, you know, you can't have, like you said, the smooth slick panel, you know, everything is specified. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it really does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. In, in Boston, actually, they have, um, some of the glass has a, a certain purplish tint. Uh, and we were thinking years ago about creating a specific restoration glass for that market. And uh, it's actually manganese that creates that tonality. Uh, but we never really um, pursued that, so. Okay, okay. Now, um, let me see, you kind of talked a, a, a lot about the changes that you have seen in the industry. Um, are there any key challenges that you have as a company? You know, I know that originally, you know, finding the architect, the restoration architects and finding those types of things. Are there any other types of uh, challenges that you've had to overcome? as a company has been time? Well, uh, the greatest form of flattery is imitation. So, uh, and when people see a great market, which this is a terrific uh, market for specialty glass or decorative glass in architecture, there are a lot of companies uh, who join in. So for example, um, back painted glass. Back painted glass is ubiquitous at this time. You can find it all over the country. Some people do it well, some people not as well. Um, some people do it in their garage. Obviously that's not the thing to, to do. Uh, you have to make sure that you use the right uh, material that adheres to the glass properly. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've created systems for installation. So we not only sell the glass, we sell an entire system to help uh, install the glass. So we've uh, recently uh, miniaturized our rain screen system into an interior system, which we call the turnkey wall system. So the turnkey wall system is um, an extrusion we developed, which gets um, screwed into the wall, into the studs. It's got a groove in it. And there are these little keys that fit into the groove and turn mechanically holding the glass in place. Uh -huh. And it has an integrated lighting system within this turnkey wall system. So now we have a system that can incorporate our back painted glass. 
if it doesn't need it doesn't need to be back painted glass it could be a laminated glass with a digitally printed interlayer that is illuminated and now we open up entirely new worlds for people it can also be used for sealing applications so because it's mechan mechan mechanically fixed uh, we also have what we call a z kiss system uh, which is z keep it simple system it's a kind of a cute name um, and uh, th this is a, a system that we've developed uh, in conjunction with our back painted glass and extrusions are placed on the back of the glass uh, and it's it allows the installer to easily hang the glass on the wall, again, uh, avoiding mastics and, and uh, VOCs. Right. So uh, we see um, systems approach being much more uh, important going forward. And uh, we're creating new systems for different applications, both interior and exterior. That's excellent. That's excellent and a, and a great point. And I think that's one of the interesting things is, as we talked, uh, your company continues to evolve and change and come up with new ways and, and reinvent itself. Uh, and that's in its of itself is an art form. Uh, but there's obviously a level up from the starting back from the violin to the stained glass. Your your family and your history is very creative. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. So uh, we have a great team and uh, uh, it's important to recognize everybody's contribution. Everybody has slightly different skill set and to, uh, to honor that and, uh, and build a team and, and uh, give them the tools they need to succeed. So, uh, and we're uh, in the process of passing the torch on to Ben Jason. Uh, he's our, my brother's son, Ben, and he's got a strong background uh, in finance. He was with GE for about five, year, five years, went through their financial management program and has been with us for about five or six years. And, uh, he's going to be uh, carrying on, and uh, uh, we're obviously going to continue to work together as a team to to grow the company. Um, about how many employees do you have? We have approximately 100 employees. Okay. I would have thought you would have been larger given the amount of all the different things that you do. I think that's amazing. Uh, well, yeah, the, we're trying to, uh, the perception of Benheim is that we're a much larger company, so we're trying to uh, to uh, create, we're, we're trying to uh, match the reality with the perception. So. Yes, well, and, and you know, if you can do it in a, on a lean and mean and with the talent, the right talent, there's no sense in, you know, adding fluff to the, you know, process. Correct. Um, so I think, you know, was there anything else that you wanted to add that we might have not have covered? Today. Well, um, we have a showroom in the city at 200 Lexington Avenue. It's in a design building. Uh, it's a really fascinating place to see. As a matter of fact, it's the background uh, uh, of my picture here. Okay. Uh, and uh, we show many different products there. Uh, if anybody wants a cook's tour of our facility in New Jersey, I give good, good cook's tours. If anybody's ever interested in visiting the factory in Germany where they make the mouth blown glass, that's a life experience, which is really interesting. And they still have great beer there. So, um, uh, and so there's uh, something else to go there besides for the beer. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually <laughs> in Valsassen, they have, uh, a, it used to be one of the centers of the, the, the Catholic church there. And they have a fascinating uh, church there. Um, and it, it's certainly worth the tour. So, and, and they have also a library there that's all, uh, that was made in the uh, Middle Ages, which is all hand carved, fascinating. So uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, all kidding aside, it's, it's really a, a great place to see, beautiful area, great people, and um, it's inspiring to see how glass can be made. Uh, some of the sheets of glass just look like pieces of art. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's fascinating. And I appreciate you, you know, giving our listeners some other, you know, maybe off the grid spots that they should go uh, check out because that's the best part of when you travel is to check out those little lone spots that, you know, those little gems. Absolutely. And if you're ever in our area, please uh, look us up and say hi. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. Um, so as far as if, you know, we've got art, an architect or a designer, someone wants to contact you, uh, what's the best way to do that? 
Um, we have a portal on our website. I believe it's info at bendheim.com. Uh -huh. uh, I can always direct person to the right uh, resource here. Uh, my email is djason at bendheim.com. Our website is uh, bendheim.com. And um, the other thing that's interesting uh, is that homeowners can order glass directly online. We created a website called Cabinet Glass. So if you go to uh, bendheimcabinetglass.com, homeowners can order over 150 different glass types directly online. There's no minimum. It ships very quickly. And uh, it's a great way to uh, uh, have some Benheim glass in your home. And we actually uh, put some of the mouth blown glasses on there and gives people access to glass otherwise they never would have or have seen. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a well-constructed website, easy to use, and uh, something that um, has gained traction over the years. So it's a, it's a good resource. Oh, that's terrific. I didn't realize that. Well, Donald, thank you for joining me today on Buckaroo TV. It's been fascinating, and um, I'm definitely going to include the links in the uh, description here so that people can go on and learn about the uh, visuals as far as the glass blowing process. And to our audience, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you very much. And if you have any questions, let us know. But uh, obviously, if you have questions for Donald, you know how to reach him uh, at Bendheim. And be sure to subscribe to our channel on Buckaroo TV. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks very it. much, Deborah. Thanks for viewing Buckaroo TV. If you'd like to learn more about B2B marketing for manufacturing and related industries, please visit us at gobuckaroo.com. 